often face dialogue, a public affairs program at the crossroads of religion and life, a series highlighting the cultural and social interaction between the worshiping and religious communities in and around the capital city. Austin Faith Dialogue is brought to you by the Austin Metropolitan Ministries in cooperation with KTVC. Join us now in Austin Faith Dialogue. In Wildflowers Across America, the book co-authored by Lady Bird Johnson and Carlton B. Dees, is written, the concepts of Eden and Paradise are likened to the need for a spiritual oasis. It's a place to refresh the soul, a place for recreation in the original sense of that word. Hello, I'm Richard Thompson, pastor of Central Presbyterian Church, and your host for this edition of Austin Faith Dialogue. The occasion for our view today is of one of Austin's finest resources, the National Wildflower Research Center, which is dedicated both to the preservation and the development of wildflower species. We're privileged to have with us the director of the center, Dr. David Northington, whom we welcome now to our program. Thank David. you, Richard. My pleasure to be here. It's great to have you. Well, thank you. And we'd like to uh, have you just share with us for a moment about um, how you happen to be in Austin doing this work at this time. Be back in Austin, actually, is the truth. I grew up in Austin. Mm -hmm. I went to UT and uh, went to graduate school, finished in 71 uh, with a degree in uh, systematic botany, taxonomy and went to Lubbock, Texas, which is like being in another country in a sense, from Central Texas at least, and was on faculty in the biology department at Texas Tech University for 13 years. And then this uh, organization started up and they searched for a director and I applied and was fortunate enough to be picked and I came back down here in 84 and have been here since. I see. So um, you're a native son, come back home. Exactly. And uh, the uh, Wildflower Center is dealing with native plants. Truly, uh, all native plants, not just wildflowers, that's our name, but we deal with native wildflowers, grasses, shrubs, trees, vines, everything. And of course our concern is that the native plants that we knew 50, 100, 150 years ago have to a great extent been removed. They've been removed for development, they've been removed for um, certainly pasture land and cropland. And all those plants that have been brought in in their stead have been exotics, introductions from other parts of the world, mm -hmm. which don't form part of the ecosystem balance that we really need to have the stability environmentally that this earth needs. And so there, there's a problem to oh, import yes. this, uh, this foreign influence, as it were. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. We, we need to stick with what we have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, we'll come back to that because okay. I think the, the whole meaning of the uh, of the wildflower research center in regard to the ecology is probably the most from a spiritual theological standpoint that is uh, very much on target but i think that we need to have a, a view here of what people see when they come to the center to visit uh, some of the tape that you've been gracious enough to share with us and let's take a look at that okay Civilization is prepared to pay a bitter price that the worth of beauty is greater than the passing pleasure that it affords. It's my pleasure today to present to you the first lady of the land, Mrs. Lyndon B. Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. I'm one of millions of Americans who are both troubled and hopeful about the physical setting of life in our country. 
As you may know, my concern has been expressed in an effort called beautification. But beautification, to my mind, is far more than a matter of cosmetics. To me, it describes the whole effort to bring the natural world and the man-made world into harmony, to bring order, usefulness, delight to our whole environment. And that, of course, only begins with trees and flowers and landscaping. In the late 60s, during Lyndon Johnson's presidency, Lady Bird Johnson used the White House as a platform to urge Americans to care more about their environment. Mrs. Johnson's efforts and an army of fellow believers, the American landscape became a part of our national agenda. Roadways became scenic routes. Parks sprang up in cities and small towns. Americans worked and watched as their land bloomed with plots of daisies and tulips and redbuds and daffodils. Over 20 years later, Lady Bird Johnson is working at another challenge to preserve our natural heritage of wildflowers, native plants and grasses so tied to the land we love. This idea had been going around in my mind for years. How could we save our native wildflowers and shrubs and trees? The fields and meadows and open spaces I knew when I first came to Austin a little over 50 years ago had been transformed into grids of housing developments, shopping malls, a spaghetti network of highways. And so I worried and wondered if our landscaping plans did not incorporate these gifts of nature, would we lose them? In 1982, at the age of 70, Lady Bird Johnson decided, in her own words, to throw my hat over the windmill and launch the National Wildflower Research Center whose purpose is to research native plants and promote their increased use. The project began rather simply. A few dedicated people, many of them old friends who had worked alongside Mrs. Johnson in the years past. 60 acres of good farmland along the Colorado River in central Texas, with money for salaries and supplies, plus a hope of understanding how an increased population and its needs might grow to embrace our legacy of natural beauty. So with a turn of a spade and a handful of wildflower seed, the center was born, and work got underway. Today, a full professional staff is dedicated to learning the how-tos of wildflower propagation and sharing this information with native plant lovers everywhere. Botanists conduct experiments, then collect and analyze data. A photographer records the seedling, mid-growth, and bloom stages of wildflowers. Other staff members produce the quarterly membership newsletter, process data for the clearinghouse, fulfill speaking engagements, and arrange tours. A core of hard-working volunteers support the staff. A board of trustees offers guidance and expertise. Okay, David, can you add to the purpose of the uh, center as it was displayed here in this video? I can enlarge on it. I don't think I can add. It was, it was pretty well said. What we're really about is trying to provide the information through research and through accumulating information that others have derived to the public and to the, uh, the commercial industries to allow for native plants to be incorporated into our planned landscapes. If we can use native grasses, native wildflowers and shrubs and trees in whatever planned landscape, whether it's a home or a business or in a park or along the highway, uh, we can return the beauty that Mrs. Johnson mentioned uh, as well as the ecological integrity and save a lot of money as well. Now, I think the best known example of that has been along the highways. I mean, Texas highways are known throughout the nation for that, that kind of innovation. Aren't they? Uh, in Texas especially, uh, the highway systems have been just uh, renowned for the beauty in the spring especially, although they have changed their, their management practices now to mow less even through the summer and in the fall. And there really is quite a good summer and fall flora out there, and it's quite colorful. 
but we're still best known for the blue bonnets and paintbrush and flocks in the spring. Mm -hmm. What's the um, uh, progress that's been made in, I think they said the, the center actually opened in what year again? 82, officially. Okay. Uh, what are, besides the highway uh, usage, uh, some of the other examples of how this research has, has paid off for the public? I think the public has realized uh, very quickly that in times of water shortages, which is one of the major issues that we've been facing for the last five or six years easily, that native plants really require, once they've been established, and they require an establishment year of watering like anything, mm -hmm. but once they've been established, they require essentially no additional water just to survive and very little additional water to truly thrive in a, in a place. So uh, the savings that, that can be realized in terms of resources, especially water and labor and time and mowing and energy, uh, just by using natives, even in a very formal landscape design, just substituting natives in for the exotics that are normally used, uh, has, I think, really caught the attention's eye. And a lot of homes, a lot of business landscapes um, are, are now turning more and more to natives. Mm -hmm. And do they turn to you for advice and counsel on this? By the thousands. We answer tens of thousands of letters and phone calls a year all over the country uh, giving people resource information. What species would we recommend for their area of the country? Mm -hmm. uh, where can they find those plants? Where are the native plant nurseries in their state or the seed producers in their state? Is our botanic garden an arboretum that has a native plant display that they can go see these plants? I mean. We like that, too. We have them growing at the center so people can come out and see what they look like. Do they really want that in their yard, and how will it look, and uh, is it really as attractive as we tell them it is? And of course it is. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems to me that uh, the significance of what you're saying and what's on the video is that much of the importance of what you're doing is not visible to the public that comes out to, to see your actual landscape, but that's going on behind the scenes in terms of this, uh, this helping folks out that write you or or consult with you? Really the majority of what we do is not visible to the public. We try to make as much of it visible as possible. We, we prefer that they do see the research plots and the demonstration plots that we plant for our own information and for the information that we pull together for our clearinghouse. Uh, we also put out just pure demonstration beds just to show them what a given species look like. Uh, from individual species to uh, really restoring an entire habitat. We've done a a reconstructed prairie. And it's very popular. People walk through that uh, for an hour or more looking at all the different things. They come back several times during the year because it changes mm -hmm. from spring to early summer to late summer to fall. They're on the site? Right there on the uh, site. A right kind of prairie of the path? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what we do behind the scenes that gets mailed out or put out in our newsletter or to our membership, or our, our journal, our publications, uh, we try to then put into practice right there on the site so they can see that we're practicing what we preach and, and that it works. Well, one of the things that uh, struck me in this uh, opening clip was how Lady Bird Johnston was identifying herself with the beautification movement. And there's a tendency or temptation, I think, to identify the Wildflower Center with beauty, you know, with, uh, with the, these colorful, outstanding plants that are highlighted there. but. She went ahead to talk about beautification in a, in a broader and a deeper sense. And, uh, and beyond the research aspect of this and the counseling part of it, uh, there is, uh, I, I, you use the word ecosystems that are supported by wildflowers. I mean, this is, you, you just mentioned it. Could you expand on that? Certainly. And we don't object, by the way, to being associated with beauty. And, mm -hmm. uh, and beautification is not a term that she prefers to use, but it does tell the people that our native flora is beautiful and we should appreciate it more. Really, what we're, what we're about is the next part of what she said in that tape, in that clip, and that is trying to get the natural world and the man-made world to be in harmony. Uh, we have a tendency as a species that uh, should be part of the natural system to really be apart from it and try to control it, man manage it, and change it. And what we're trying to get people to do is to say, I want to take this ability that I have as an, an organism that can manipulate and control and grow and plant to return it to more of the natural ecosystem balances mm -hmm. that it, it knew before we came in and started changing things. So planting native species, especially in community groupings, so that if you have 
the part of the country you're from, let's say, is the Midwest, and you have grasses and perennial wildflowers, but no shrubs and trees, then you use that particular community of plants in your landscaping as much as possible. Now, everyone likes trees, and certainly you should plant some trees. Again, you should try to plant the trees that are closest to you geographically mm -hmm. to have them do the best ecologically in terms of providing habitat for wildlife and nesting places and uh, soil erosion control and water conservation. And so to the extent that the flora and the fauna go together to preserve the wildflowers is also to preserve the, the animal species. Exactly. I think endangered species is one of those catchy phrases that it does catch people's attention. And we're very interested in endangered species. We've initiated several new projects at the center this year, and we'll start some more next year. But we use endangered species as an indicator, as a marker, that the habitat from which that species originally came is damaged, and it can no longer exist. Those species are not inferior. They're not weak. They just have had their habitat removed. Mm -hmm. If we can learn to replace that habitat by planting native species, and that can be done maybe even a backyard size habitat, then reestablishment of that endangered species, successful reestablishment, indicates that we have actually reestablished the entire habitat, not just save one species, mm -hmm. but all the species in that group. And that's really the importance of the endangered species. It's not that we just want to save that one, although that's certainly the end result, we hope, but the entire habitat it depended upon has now been studied and understood. Okay, carry that one step further. Let's say that we lost some of those species, uh, the, the uh, endangered animal life. What difference would that make to the average person? Well, even more importantly, the endangered plant species, but in, in endangered animals as well, uh, what difference does it make directly to the average sure. person? Probably uh -huh. nothing directly. All right. But no species exists in isolation. All of them are interdependent. They need each other. They interact with each other. Mm -hmm. And you take one piece of the puzzle away, and you start losing the entire structure. And another piece away, and weaken a third one and that structure starts falling apart. That's I what see. ecosystem balance really implies. Down the road, we're going to lose a species that might have been the next um, great cure for some horrible disease or a new crop plant to feed millions. All right. We don't know what it is we're losing because once it's lost, unless it's something we've studied before it's gone, mm -hmm. we don't know what its potential was to us as humans. Now, to us as humans as part of that ecosystem, we're losing part of our world, okay. and, which is part of us. I think that uh, we'll have occasion to expand on that a bit as we look at uh, a few more minutes of the, the clip that people can see when they come to visit with you. Great. And uh, let's see what comes next. The priorities of the Wildflower Center are research and education. Although there are approximately 20,000 species of wildflowers in the United States, only about 200 of these have been researched to any degree. By studying these wildflowers and other native plants, the Wildflower Center is finding answers to economic and environmental problems. Our research involves the studying of the ecology of species so we can learn how to incorporate them in landscapes. My job is to work on the techniques of using wildflowers, such as ground preparation, seeding rates, planting times, and how to manage native species for optimum results. Our ultimate goal is to provide the kind of information the public needs to restore plant communities to an ecological balance. While research identifies the questions and provides the answers needed to understand native plants, the Clearinghouse is the heart of the Wildflower Center, gathering data from institutions and individuals and answering thousands of requests for information each year. Here, research information is condensed into a usable form and shared with landscape architects, park managers, backyard gardeners, anyone who wants to know more about using wildflowers and native plants in a planned environment. The majority of the requests for information from the National Wildflower Research Center are directed to the clearinghouse here we have an extensive library on wildflowers and other native plants, a comprehensive slide library, and an up-to-date archive consisting of all articles written about the center. In addition, 
the Clearinghouse database contains information on native plant nurseries, seed sources, and appropriate organizations. We all know wildflowers as beautiful palettes of color splashed across open fields and roadsides. But there's another side to wildflowers and native plants which makes understanding them all the more important. Savings of millions of dollars annually are realized each year for those states who have sharply reduced mowing and maintenance along highways seeded with wildflowers. Land developers and landscape architects have discovered the economic benefits of designs using native plants which require less water, maintenance, and are capable of surviving climate extremes. With the right planting techniques, gardeners find that once established, wildflowers require less attention, provide a seasonal sequence of color, and return year after year. Using our native flora in our landscape plans result in assets of increased time and money to every land manager, whether a city planner, park commissioner, or the homeowner who incorporates patches of wildflowers to complement a manicured lawn. Less water, that was one of the phrases that they just used that caught my attention, because in a semi-arid climate, where we're prone to drought these days, I would think that that in itself would justify the, the purpose of the center. If you had to pick one overriding reason to incorporate native plants into the planned landscapes, that would be probably the best reason. Uh, summer consumption of fresh water in this country is about 55% of all the fresh water consumed goes to landscape watering, and yet we have shortages. Um, mm -hmm. We pump 89 billion gallons of underground water per day in this country, and a lot of that goes to agriculture. If we run short of water, I'd rather see it go to agriculture than to my front lawn. Mm -hmm. I can't graze my front lawn. All right. Well, I, I have a feeling that as we move into the future, the, uh, the need for what you're doing will increase, and just from that standpoint. I think so, and, and the information we're trying to provide is catching on quite rapidly, actually. It's been incorporated in many areas of the country in different ways. I'd like to make sure that uh, before we get too much further into our deliberations that we have the number of the Wildflower Center shared with uh, our viewing audience. And uh, tell us how we get there. Well, it's really quite easy to find. We're pretty far out east, but it's not difficult. The phone number, if you'd like to call us and get mm -hmm. information or come by, is 929-3600. All right. And if you want to come out and see us, and we'd love to have you between 9 and 4 any weekday. And in the spring, we have some weekend days, but check with us. Mm -hmm. You come out either MLK, which is uh, old 19th Street for us Austinites, and uh, you go out past... 183, about four miles, is the first light after you pass the Travis State School. And uh, you turn right, there's a sign, a highway department sign, on Farm to Market 973, turn right or head south, and it's two miles down the road. There's four tall antennas on the property. If you come out 71, headed to Bastrop, past Burks from about a mile mm -hmm, and a half, mm -hmm. same story. First light, turn left, okay. and hit up 973. Well, you know, there are two things in... Um the, the book on wildflowers that we quoted at the beginning that I wanted to come back to. One has to do with the story of Thomas Drummond, the Scots, uh, Scotsman who came to uh, survey uh, the, the species of this land and come to find out uh, there was a native Texas plant that has become world-renowned, and we had forgotten that in the meantime. Could you just summarize that for well, us? Well, approximately 150 years ago, he collected a lot of different species and sent them back, and one of them was very popular, and they started growing it as a, a favorite garden ornamental, and that's our native phlox. Mm -hmm. And it's been named after him. It's Phlox Drummondii, and uh, we realized that that was a beautiful garden plant and started buying it from the European producers and got it over here and started planting it and said that sure looks a lot like the native stuff and sure enough it was. Mm -hmm. So we didn't appreciate how exotic it was until it was no longer part of our own native flora. Yeah. How, how long ago was it that we discovered that it was a native Texan? Oh, well, quite a few years ago, 30, 40 years ago, uh, that it was being produced and sold commercially back to us, but uh, mm -hmm. we still buy it. Doesn't that uh, suggest, though, just the interdependence of, of the ecological uh, that we borrow 
across the world in this regard. And, um, and sometimes we have to have those from abroad help us to appreciate what's close at hand. As long as it works and we finally appreciate what we have close at hand and how important it is and it does add to the ecological balance, it, it's a good lesson to learn, though. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I'd be interested to know, too, uh, in terms of uh, what's most satisfying to you about your work. I think that really the thing that's most satisfying is to see that it really is making a difference. It really is change. People are starting to become not just ecologically sensitive and aware, but really ecologically educated and are concerned. They really do care about their environment. They do see themselves as part of that environment as opposed to apart from it and in control of it. And that's very satisfying. That, that gives me a feeling that uh, the human race has a sensitivity toward the world around them that uh, they must have. And you're also, uh, I, I, I pick up from you, uh, have a sense of hope about this. It's not just in the midst of all the despair about the world uh, fouling its own nest, but that there are things that can be done and are being done in that regard. Uh, exactly. I, that, that is the one thing that the Wildflower Center is probably the most proud of. We, we feel like we are providing a positive so solution to environmental and e ecological problems, not just a slowdown or a recycling or a conservation of what's out there, but actually gaining ground on it, replacing what used to be there and make a positive environmental repair effort. And mm -hmm. uh, that feels good to be doing something positive instead of just bemoaning the, the Bringing your negatives. Hands. Oh, yeah. It, it's it's uh -huh. good to do something active. Every time you plant a native plant, it, it adds to and, and cumulatively provides for this ecological uh, repair that we're looking for. Well, you have certainly added to both our understanding and our sense of hope in that regard, and we very much appreciate your spending this time with us. Oh, my pleasure. I appreciate being asked. And we're delighted to have you folks looking in today, and, and what have you recall, one other thing from the wildflowers across America, the statement that uh, the park, the public garden, the tree-lined river through a city, these are not only physical uh, assets, it's, it's an appreciation of their spiritual significance that is brought home as Today, on behalf of the Austin Metropolitan Ministries, I would be happy to have you join us again next week. Richard Thompson, and thank you for watching. For more information, call Austin Metropolitan Ministries at 472-7627.